going to be boring. Eh? I mean, I, I've put something up. Good evening. Good evening. Right, hi. Okay. And I'm not talking to the parents. We're all the children. Ah, here they are. Okay. Um, I, put a, I put a note up um, this evening um, and talking to Bethan about what we were going to call this evening's talk. And uh, we decided that we would go something along the lines of a challenging employment world. Um, and what's going to make the difference to you as individuals in landing that first job? And this word challenge, I was really struck by it on the weekend as to what my challenge is tonight. So all of you are going to have a challenge as you leave the school. And that challenge is going to be to land your first job. And I'll tell you a little bit why I think it's a significant challenge. But my challenge tonight is to do what my daughter on Sunday afternoon said to my other daughter while we were going for some lunch. So I have one daughter who's studying philosophy up at Nottingham, and I have another one who's in A-levels and just about to finish her exams. And this, I mean her year, and this Friday, she's got an interview for a job over the summer holiday with Wimbledon. And so she was saying to me in the, from the back of the car, she said, Dad, are you around this week? And I said, yeah. She said, well, what evenings are you at home? And I said, I'm not at home any evening except, I think, on Thursday evening. She said, no, but what are you doing on Wednesday evening? Because on Thursday, because she wants to practice an interview with me uh, one of the evenings during the course of the week. So I said to her, no, I'm not at home until I think Thursday evening. Thursday evening is my first evening at home. She said, well, what are you doing on Wednesday evening? Because I'm home Wednesday evening. I said, well, I'm doing a talk at a school around how to prepare yourself for that first job. And after about five minutes, I heard her saying to Jen, she said, and she said to Jen, oh, Dad is going to want to do one of these talks, you know. I hate it when these guys from the outside come in and do these career talks. And it's so boring. So hopefully my challenge tonight is not to leave you feeling completely bored in terms of what I'm going to say. But it is a really serious issue, this. It's a really serious issue. Now, you know, um, and this is something that when I was talking to a lot of the headmasters and headmistresses, um, I, I, I really, really have become really passionate in trying to send a message to young people, particularly young people who are leaving schools like this, I looked on your website this afternoon and kind of, when did this school begin? You know, in the 1700s. And the credo of the school and what the school is offering you as young people, compared to the majority of people out there, uh, you should really, really have an edge as you go to look for a job. But if you haven't used the opportunities that you've got and have been given in the school, you'll have time between when you leave school and your first interview to maybe just hone that edge. And what do I mean by honing this edge? How many of you watched um, Murray play Djokovic the other day? couple. Maybe those who really enjoy tennis. Now, from a technical point of view, Murray is as good as Djokovic. Yet, Murray can hardly ever beat Djokovic. Why? I love asking this question because everybody's eyes just go down. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Oh, you're in some other part. Okay. You can. There's my first test of whether this is boring or not. But Djokovic always beats Murray. Why? Stronger mentally. Stronger mentally? Yeah, he's the winner in his consciousness. Beg your pardon? He's the winner. Winner in his consciousness, he believes so much in himself that he's the winner. 
The sad thing about it is probably some of those things are right, but the sad thing about it is that there is only one winner. <laughs> and during some of my time at Unilever, as I was part of my career doing graduate recruitment, guess how many applicants we would get just here in the UK for 40 jobs? How many? How many? A thousand? Or thousands? How many thousands? Two? Five? It's like an auction. Eight thousand applicants. For how many jobs? Forty. So this is a little bit like how do you become the Murray or the Serena Williams of tennis? How are you going to become that? How are you going to be one of those 40 out of 8,000? The other thing that we should think about is once we've gone from 8,000, and let's assume we've now, we have got these 40 jobs, how many people do you think get to the final round of assessment for those 40 jobs? 120. One in three. So out of 8,000, we go to 120. At least I got to the 120. <laughs> Not good enough. Who came second in the 100 meters of the Olympic Games? The men's final. Do you know who came first? Bolt. You say Bolt. Who came second? Don't care. And nobody knows. <laughs> That's why it's a challenge, and it's tough out there. It's tough. <coughs> and you know what's even more tough, I think? And it might not apply to all of you, but I can tell you it's applying to my daughter. See, when I went to university, and I graduated from university, a degree equaled the job, and I had no debt. Most graduates today graduate from university with a degree, no job, and debt. And the numbers play this out. And I don't have to read all of that for you. But it's a mighty, mighty tough world out there. And the days of who you know might help you to get to the 120. Might. But have no bearing on whether you are one of the 40. Who does it depend upon as to whether you are one of the 40? You. Nobody else. Nobody else but you. So what are you going to do to try and become one of those 40? Why you? Why you? Now, if you think about any kind of selection process, and we kind of try and get a sense of, let's try and unpack this, and think about what are some of the characteristics, 
traits but, or attributes. But what do you think are some of the characteristics that might, well, let's call it a checklist of things that you need to have to become, I would say, at least one of the 120. So, I've been at Godolphin, and things like that. It was so weird, I was talking to somebody just two days ago. She's the managing partner of an organization called Made by Many, which is a digital design company. And um, I said to her, I said, she said to me, what are you doing this week? And I said, I'm going down to a school in Wiltshire. Uh, Salisbury, she says, I'm from Salisbury. She said, well, I'm going to do a school, at a, at a, I'm going to talk at a girls' school there. She said, which one? I said, Godolphin. She said, I went to Godolphin. Georgie Mack, or any of those kind of older staff members that are around, that's her name. But what do you think is, what do you think is one of the things that'll help me to get? So I've been to Godolphin, I've gone to university, and now I'm beginning to apply for these different jobs. What is the first thing that you think is going to be really important to help you go from the 8,000 to the 120? Sure you do. When I, you know, I taught once upon a time, so I taught for about three years, math symbology, and then it was like maximum effort for minimum financial return. So I stumbled on Unilever, which was minimum effort for maximum financial return. But I can assure you it was minimum effort for maximum emotional return in teaching, because all you had to do was tell a kid they were great and they would be great. But what do you think it is? What do you think, what do you think is that? One of the really basic things you're going to have to come out of university with, and I don't want parents to answer this one. Uh, let's, before we even get there, so the, pre, the answer was confidence, and it's a really good answer. But before I even go to that sort of thing, what do you think is going to be really important? Because I've got these 8,000 applications, and by the way, I can't go through 8,000 applications. So who goes through it for me? Some machine with a program that programs and has been programmed to kick certain things out into a waste paper bin and then to deliver a very automatic response letter which says, I regret to inform you. So what do you think the machine is looking for in your application? And you've just been to university. Yes. We'll come to that. Experience. But the machine can't, it's difficult for the machine to read the experience. Be part of What's that? Any errors in your application. Errors in the application? Uh, no. Aha. Your academic results at university. Obvious. And when do you think the machine just kicks in? Because it's been programmed below what grade that you go into the regret basket. We've got 8,000 people here, by the way. At what grade? 2-1. Two, 2-2. Two. So 2-1 and above, aha, I now get into, I'm still in the game. Wimbledon, I'm still in the, I've kind of got through the first round. Got through the first round. Good academic results. When you get down to those 120 and you look to each side of yourself, what do you think when it comes to academic results? When you see the people that you're competing with? They've probably got the same. A first or an upper second. So there's no real differentiation. No real differentiation once you've got to the 120. But academic results are absolutely critical. And I'm sure you're going to say to me, yeah, but Jeff, we know that. That's obvious. What is the second key attribute that you think you're going to have to have to... And remember where we're going now. We're going to... We, we're trying to become the Serena Williams. 
or the job of it. We're trying to win one will We're trying to get that job. What do you think might be the second? <coughs> Somebody's already said it. Somebody said it. Aha, uh -huh. Mary caught you again. <laughs> experience. Experience. Work experience. Now, there are different types of work experience. So I've not got you, because I think it's really important that during your holidays, you're going out there and you're getting some kind of work experience. But remember, I'm talking about now a period of, let's assume that the majority of you are going to go to university or you're going to go and do some sort of qualification which is going to be two or three years long. And because you're living in the UK, you spend more time on holiday than you do at university. Tell me about it. My daughter, I mean, she's just on holiday all the time, spending all this money that she's going to have to pay back for being at university. What does she do in those holidays? You have a choice. You have a choice. In those 120, every single one of them will have done work experience. Every single one of them will have done work experience. So what's going to differentiate you in terms of the work experience? Quality and quantity. Alright, let's talk about the quality. What do you mean by the quality of the work experience? Okay, okay. What else do you think around the quality of your work experience? See, I've had people that have got down to the 120 and I've asked them the question, so tell me what has been your work experience over the last four years? <coughs> what has been your work experience over the last four years? And one individual will respond, well, I worked in the pub at university during the holidays. I worked in the local store in my hometown during the holidays. I went and worked in Wimbledon during the holidays. And then the other person says to me, well my first holiday I went into Africa and I taught young kids how to speak English. My second holiday, I went to China and I taught young disadvantaged Chinese children how to speak English. My third holiday, I went to Vietnam and I worked with AIDS orphans in Vietnam. Who am I warming to? Who of those two am I starting to just warm to? Big pardon? The second. Why the second? Because I can tell you, working in a pub is a tough job and it can be difficult and you've got really difficult customers that you've got to deal with and all the rest. And working in Wimbledon can be really tough because you have time with all these lovely celebrities and you chat to them and you get to know them. But why am I warming to the second? Big point. Um, no, let's assume they both were paid. Say that again. Oh, say it loudly. <laughs> say that loudly. You got out of your comfort zone. You got out of your comfort zone. What happens when we get out of our comfort zone? Mm -hmm. We grow. We grow. We learn to fend for ourselves. We build something which is very much in your credo about what this school is trying to give you. You start to build what? Once you get out of your comfort zone, you grow and you begin to build experience, yeah, personality, skills, new skills, different skills. 
once you're out of your comfort zone, you're having to apply yourself in a very, very different kind of way. And so I know people will say to you, listen, it's so important to get that word. But I'm just, all I'm trying to do today is I'm just trying to send you a message of, I want you to be one of the 40, not one of the 120. Or the, I don't know what, minus 120 from 8,000. I want you to be one of those, one of, one of the 40. So, we've said academic results. And we've said, work experience, and hopefully all you remember is quality and out of my comfort zone. Quality and out of my comfort zone. What do you think might be the third attribute to get you to be maybe one of the 120 and maybe one of the 40? I saw a guy do a talk once. And halfway through the talk, he took his tie off, he took his jacket off, and he said, right, I've shown you some respect. <laughs> it's kind of how I'm feeling now. Yeah. What else? Yeah. What else? Interest in the company. I, I think that I'll come to you. I, I, that's a, who said that? Interest in the company. I think it's a really good point, and we'll come to it, which is about, and, but in, in many ways, it's a kind of what I would call a hygiene factor. You know, there, might, there, will be, there will be opportunity for you to apply to many, many companies. But what you've got to do is you've got to say, hey, because you're going to have to apply to many. But what you've got to do is you've got to say, look, there are four or five that I'd love to work for. And then you put all your energy, all your effort, behind preparing your application in the best possible way for those four or five, getting to know those companies inside out. But amongst those 120, they will have done that. What do you think? Passion. Passion? Aha! But I wasn't actually looking at you. There's a lovely girl behind you who had a hand up and ask it, but yes, you've got it right. But what were you going to say? Okay, so let's talk about skills and talents. Skills and talents. In particular, what skills? Yes. Yes. But you'd probably find amongst the 120, you know, they've all got the skills because they, you know, they're kind of going for a particular job. But there's a particular skill or attribute. Um, we're getting close. Now, we're nearly there. For a team to work effectively, what has everybody in that team got to be able to do well with each other? Three what, what sort of people skills? Communication, that they all, all of these things, manners, communication, they all build to developing something that's, that we can't do without if we want to be an effective team. We, adaptability, yes. Reliability, reliability yes. But what does is, what is adaptability, reliability, and all of that build between you and I? If I'm adaptable, if I'm reliable, if I do what I say I'll do in the team, no, what do we... Trust, and so therefore we build. I heard it. Relationships. Relationships. Your ability to build relationships. I no longer, in the 25 years that I've worked for Unilever, I could do nothing on my own. Particularly when I became a manager. I could do nothing on my own. The only thing that got me to be able to do things and do them successfully was whether I could build relationships. And in order to build 
relationships, what kind of intelligence do you think you need? Emotional. Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. So yes, your academic results gives me a sense of your intellect. But your emotional intelligence, your ability to adapt, your ability to listen to other people. You know sometimes in a team, you have people in the team, you just wish that person would just shut their <laughs> mouth up. And just for a moment, think as to why God gave them two ears and only one mouth. <laughs> so your ability to listen, your ability to adapt, your ability to communicate, your ability to show empathy to others, your ability to facilitate and bring others in and make them part of and feel part of. Emotional intelligence. Now, how do you know what your emotional intelligence is? See, I, you know what your... I've got a performance injury, so I might have to sit for a second. But what... I mean, you all know your, your, your intellect, because you look at your results. <coughs> what feedback do you get on your emotional intelligence? But maybe some of your friends, you know, behind your back say, well, maybe it's a bit of a. The only way you are going to understand your own emotional intelligence is how self aware of you of who you are. How self aware are you of the impact that you have on others? Do you know that? Have you asked a really, really good friend who will be honest with you? And so this ability to build your own self-awareness, because you know we're not all great. We've all got things that irk others, that annoy others, which an interviewer likes to say, well, tell me, what are your weaknesses? By the way, I come from a philosophy of focus on people's strengths, not their weaknesses. But you need to be aware of those weaknesses. And so building an element of self-awareness, while you're here, when you go off to do what you're going to do, so that you can get a sense of what is your emotional intelligence. Are you one of those really domineering people who just have got a very dogmatic and they've got their own point of view and they're never wrong? You know them. You know them. And so this whole area of emotional intelligence and understanding your impact that you have on others and your ability to build relationships with others becomes absolutely critical. And you might say to me, well Jeff, how, do you, how, do you, how are you going to measure that in an interview? Well, we don't just do an interview. So the assessment centre is not made up of just an interview. The assessment centre is made up of a group discussion where we ask you to talk about, well, marriage is an outdated institution, for example. And then we watch and listen to how people talk about it. And whether there's one person in the group that just dominates all the time, or one person who has to be the leader, because they're just trying to impress me who's observing the conversation. And so this thing around emotional intelligence becomes really, really important. So we've got academic results. 
We've got the quality, the quality of your back work which shifts you out of your comfort zone. We've got this thought around relationships depending upon emotional intelligence. What else? Now you can your turn. <laughs> he said passion and energy. And I would, I would underlie that with attitude. You can't learn attitude. It's a wonderful differentiator. Because attitude drives your degree of energy, your degree of passion. And the only person who controls your attitude Nobody else. It's what we call an internal locus of control. There's some people who like to blame everything on something else. I'm in a bad mood on a Monday morning because it's Monday. I'm in a wonderful mood on a Friday morning because it's Friday. I'm in a bad mood because the weather is not so nice. And with attitude comes energy and comes passion. And somebody with the right attitude who brings energy and passion, I will have any day in my team. Any day. Because I, 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 I think that there are, and this is being extreme, but there are these different kind of personalities. But at the one end, there are these people that I call drains. They are amazing people because they have the ability to drain and suck every bit of energy out of you when you are with them. They just have that wonderful ability to just suck it. So you arrive into the group and you're in a good mood and then that individual is there and just sucks it all out. And then you are, have other people at the other extreme who are radiators. All they do is radiate energy. Who would you rather work with? Stupid question. <laughs> hey? Now, this comes back to this bit about self-awareness. And there are people in this room who are shy. And there are people in this room who not because they want to be a drain, just because <coughs> of the way they are, are not very good at displaying energy and passion. For those, I say to you, you've got to do something about it. Because you're going to be out against 120 who display energy and passion. <coughs> and drive. And know why they want to join that company. And know why they want to do the job that they want to do. You see, I sit in interviews and somebody will say, I'll say to them, So tell me, why do you want to work in human resources? Here's what they say. What, what do you think they say? I want to be in human resources because I love working with... Well, I just want to be sick when they say that. I mean, please. I'd rather work with a machine or a computer because it doesn't answer me back. It's got no emotions. Don't tell me it's wonderful working with people. Because it's not. Because amongst those people you get these drains and you get all sorts of types. You get political animals and you get... Pol I mean... And by the way, if you work in marketing, or if you work in the supply chain, or if you work as a doctor, or if you work as a nurse, you are working with people. So, you know, so when you get asked the question, so why do you want to work in human resources, 
you're up against these 120. You didn't give an intelligent answer as to why you've done that degree, what you've learned, what is of interest to you, what gives you passion. Not what 99.9% of people say to me. I want to be working with people. I just love them. I love working with them. Academic results? She's been listening. Academic results? What else? What about the work experience? The quality of the work experience? What else? What is communication and listening? It all leads to building what? Relationships. Relationships. Which means you've got to have a good understanding of your what intelligence? Emotion. Your emotional intelligence. Maybe two other things that I want to talk about which I think are becoming more and more important. Amongst men, between the age of 30 and 50 in this country is what? <coughs> no. Not heart attacks. Suicide. Suicide. Thank you. <laughs> Just let that sink in. Like the water sinking in. The leading cause of death amongst men between the ages of 30 and 50 in this country is suicide. The number of women who attempt to commit suicide is the same as the number of men in that age group. They just less successful. So this word called resilience, which I detest, because I do a lot of work right now in trying to break the stigma linked to depression and anxiety in the corporate world. And the word resilience, it just conjures up for me that you've got to be tough, which just reinforces the stigma. But in the world that we are living today, a world which is hugely volatile, who would have thought two years ago that we would have had a migrant crisis like we have got across Europe today? Who would have? It's hugely uncertain. What is certain is that Donald Trump is not going to be the president of the United States. <laughs> but for the rest, we're not sure. It's very, very complex. It's hugely ambiguous. Should we all just go in and bomb Syria? Complex question. Thank you. And it's very, very ambiguous. So we're living in a world, I call it a VUCA world. V for volatile, U for uncertain, C for complex, and A for ambiguous. And when you leave here, you're entering it. And I can tell you while you are here, you're experiencing it. And why am I seeing the incidence of depression and anxiety begin to go through the roof amongst young people? You have these expectations on you. You have this, I'm going to get a degree and then there's no job. And I've got this blasted thing called an iPhone which allows people to cyberbully you. And so what you are going to have to learn to do, and I've learned the hard way, is build a level of resourcefulness 
that is going to allow you to endure these complex and difficult times. And so your ability to be resourceful in brackets, and hopefully one day we'll get rid of the word, resilient, your ability to be resourceful is really, really important. One of the scarcest resources that I see in organizations today, and when I see, talk about organization, I'm talking about the NHS, I might be talking about the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, I might be talking about Unilever. The resource that I see that is in least supply is what do you think it is? Parents, you're allowed to answer. Collaboration. No. Um, yes and no. When I, was, when I was a teacher, I was told never to say no. Because <laughs> if you say no to the question that gets answered, then that person will never try and answer a question again. No, it's a doubt. It's a resource. The scarcest resource in organizations today is energy. People are more and more burnt out. And remember what I was saying about passion, energy, and drive. The only way you are going to be able to maintain the passion, the energy, the drive, is if you look after your well-being. At the level of physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And so being resourceful in those areas becomes absolutely critical. You know, somebody taught me dental hygiene. And because they taught me dental hygiene, guess what has not happened? <laughs> no, they are my real teeth. Okay, they haven't fallen out. Nobody ever, and I wish they had, nobody ever taught me mental hygiene. So my plea to you is go and learn what does it take to be mentally resourceful. Because the world out there is tough. And I know that it's not only out there, I know that it's also right here and now. And so this characteristic around resourcefulness and looking after your well-being is going to be absolutely critical. So what have we got? Academic results, relationships, emotional intelligence, vocation work and the quality of that, bringing energy, passion to what you do, and learning to be resourceful, to use the resources at your disposal to, to wade through and manage through this very VUCA world that we live in. And then finally, finally, and this, I suppose, has become, I don't know, this, this is probably more of a very personal point of view. But it kind of does always tell me something about the individual. In trying to differentiate people. But what I'm really, what I do get very interested in, is, what impact do you want to have on society. What impact do you want to have on society? And what impact, while you were at school, while you were at university, what impact did you have on society?
There are 60 people in the world whose net asset worth is the equivalent to half of the world's population. It just can't be right. What are you going to do about it? And that takes me to leadership. The final point that I want to make around differentiation. That takes me to leadership. <coughs> and I know that often when I ask the question around, so tell me about the kind of leadership roles that you've had, and people will say, well, I was this and I was that and all the rest. And then I must say, okay, well, good, okay, so you're a good leader. I'm not really interested in the roles that you display. What I'm interested in, as a leader, what change did you bring about for the good? Anybody can be a leader. <coughs> but the 40 leaders are those that brought about change for the good as a result of the responsibility and the accountability for the disposal. So it's not good enough to just say you were the head boy, or the head girl, or the head of house. It's not good enough. All 40 were of that, all 120, they were all that. I want to know what change you brought about. And change for the good. Change for the good. So, sometimes I draw that with all of those circles <coughs> intertwined with a sweet spot in the middle. Which I suppose at the end of the day is the final differentiator. And get you from the 120 to the 40. You're resourceful. You have, you have, in the short time that you left school, or even while you were at school, you've begun to have an impact on society. You've shown leadership, which has brought about change for the good. Your academic results are good. Your ability to get on with other people and build relationships is fantastic. And you have energy, passion, and drive. And so at the end of the day, I recruit one word. I don't recruit academic results. I don't recruit relationship building. What do you think I recruit? And in your answer around Djokovic, you were almost there. As to why he always beats Murray. What do you think I recruit at the end of the day? Personality. Big pardon? Personality. You're almost there. I recruit character. Nothing more than that. Now you can leave Godolphin and you can go off to whatever you're going to do for the next three or four years <coughs> and you can do that much to build character which comes out of being out of your comfort zone which comes out of having a point of view on things making an impact, bringing about change I know who I'll recruit I know who I'll recruit. And you have ample, ample opportunities coming your way. And if you hear nothing else tonight, please don't go study or whatever you're going to do and not get involved. And not get yourself out of your comfort zone. And not participate in the extracurricular activities that are provided to you. Where in each of those you're thinking about how is this contributing 
to me building character, building personality. Don't, don't let that opportunity pass you by. And Anna said that maybe what I should do in the, when I started this talk was to talk a little, tell you a little bit about myself and my career. And I'm going to do it right at the end. Because it was my, only my ability to do some of that stuff which resulted in me getting some real reward. And that reward has been working for a company like Unilever for 25 years. Started in South Africa, came to the UK, spent five years working across Africa, the Middle East, and Turkey. Went to Australia, spent three years working out of Australia. Came back to the UK and traveled the world on Unilever. Had my children almost educated on Unilever. Earned enough money to offer some security to my wife and to my girls. Leaving South Africa and coming to live in the UK when Anna was six months, and Jennifer was only three, required a significant amount of coming out of our comfort zone. Which led to growth of me and Debbie and the girls. Amazing opportunity for different jobs in different parts of the world in terms of a career. And then finally, being so lucky, being so lucky, being so lucky to work for an organization that truly wants to have an impact on society. And through that organization, rather than having to necessarily go and work for a charity, and by the way, I love charities, but through an organization to be able to have this impact on society. Who would want that sort of life? It's not going to come easily, but it's possible. And the only person that it's up to is you. You see, we can all live. We can all love. But only a few of us can truly, truly matter. Go and matter.